Good afternoon, and welcome to this presentation on Bishop Michael Power. On behalf of the Knights of Columbus Museum, thank you for joining this session, which is one of several online programs for the benefit of our museum patrons. Uh, we have been offering these sessions for several months now since the closing of the Knights of Columbus Museum. I'm sorry to report that the museum does remain closed, but for updates about the museum, its events, and its offerings, please visit kofcmuseum.org, or you can follow the museum on its social media channels at kofcmuseum. A reminder for those of you who have not participated before in these online sessions that you can submit questions at any point during the presentation. There's a questions utility on the right margin of your screen. I'll address a selection of your questions to our presenter in the Q&A portion of the presentation at the end of the talk, and that should last on the order of 30 to 40 minutes. Today's uh, talk centers, as I said, on Bishop Michael Power. And it's, it's curious because the role of the Catholic Church and the famine Irish migration in Canada is very noteworthy. And it, the current situation with the treatment of patients uh, dealing with the COVID virus uh, shows the concern of the medical personnel putting themselves often in harm's way in their care and treatment. Bishop Michael Power died in a fever shed in Toronto in the infamous year of 1847. And to me, that is a very uh, poignant reminder of how many clergy and religious and lay people put themselves into mortal danger to serve others. Now, Bishop Power was Toronto's first bishop, and he is a candidate for canonization as a martyr of charity. Dr. Mark McGowan, who is a Knight of Columbus and a church history professor at uh, St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto, is our presenter today. He specializes in Canadian, Irish, religious, and immigration history, particularly the famine Irish migration to Canada in the 1840s and Irish participation in World War I. In 2009, his book, Death or Canada, was the basis for a joint award-winning Canada-Ireland docudrama on the famine and aired in Canada, Ireland, and the United States and Britain. He's written books on Ireland, Canada, immigration, and religion, which have won numerous and prestigious awards. Among his other titles are The Imperial Irish, Canada's Irish Catholics Fight the Great War, 1914 to 1918, and It's Our Turn, Carrying on the Work of Pioneers of Catholic Education in Ontario. Mark has visited the Knights of Columbus Museum and has lectured there, and he is an active member serving as the recorder of St. John the Evangelist Council 4895 in Whitby, Ontario. He's gonna share his knowledge today about Bishop Power and the Black 47, that infamous year. Um, it may be more familiar to our Canadian audience than it is to our American audience, but I think we'll all have uh, a great deal of interest in it nonetheless. Mark, it's wonderful to reconnect with you and to have you share uh, the story of Bishop Power with our museum audience. So I turn the program over to you. Well, thank you very much, Peter. And it, it really is, uh, you know, I'm delighted that I was invited and as a Canadian and as a, a Canadian knight, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to tell uh, a Canadian story uh, that uh, really resonates uh, among uh, many people once they hear it because Bishop Power was one of the more mysterious figures uh, in Canadian history because he he lived for such a short period of time uh, and was only Bishop uh, of Toronto appointed in December of 1841 and then died uh, in October of 1847. So um, he left very little behind. Uh, his correspondence is light compared to many other bishops of Toronto and of many of the dioceses in the United States. And so um, it was often said that when I wrote his biography uh, and published it in 2005, I mean, one of my graduate students said, you really made uh, bricks without straw because there wasn't that much there. But the, the surprising thing is, is that the more you poked and the more you prodded, and thanks to archivists in Ireland, uh, in Italy, in France, and uh, in the United States, um, I was able to piece together, I think, this really important story, and, and it made even more important now uh, by the fact that uh, that Michael Power is, 
is being promoted uh, for canonization and those brother knights know quite well that this is a long and drawn out process having witnessed uh, the, the, the ongoing development of, uh, of uh, Venerable Father Michael McGivney's uh, process uh, uh, in, our, in our own time. And so uh, in 2017, uh, Cardinal Thomas Collins, the Archbishop of Toronto, uh, proposed uh, that uh, this process uh, come underway and uh, it's I'm just very happy to have been part of uh, the first biography the first full-length biography written of this bishop and what I'd like to do is really take you on his journey uh, from uh, his home base his his birthplace in Halifax and then take you right through uh, the the famine journey that he makes uh, and uh, and finally as he succumbs to typhus uh, short of his uh, 43rd birthday on October the 1st, 1847. We'll see if we can get all that done in about 30 minutes, and I'd gladly entertain questions afterwards. And uh, uh, as I say, I am, uh, I'm particularly proud as a Knight of Columbus to be able to facilitate uh, this particular session uh, with you and, uh, and, to, and to broaden our, our knowledge as Knights of, of other parts of the world. And uh, uh, I'm not an American, as you can tell by, by my accent, and uh, by my flag in the background, I am a Canadian. So uh, uh, if I do make some mistakes on the on the American side of things, uh, forgiveness is always a very good thing. Okay. So uh, one of the problems that we had about Michael Power from from the very beginning was was that we really didn't even know what he looked like um, because uh, in the 1830s and 40s, uh, photography was uh, was had not been commercialized. It was uh, it wasn't something that became uh, more common until the 1850s and the 1860s. In fact, the American Civil War became one of the most photographed, the first photographed. Uh, uh, combat. So one of the struggles that we had from the very beginning was getting a sense of of what did this man actually look like. And you have a a, a, a an artist conception uh, on your screen. And uh, uh, but uh, here is uh, probably the one of the more prominent pictures of Michael Power. Uh, we don't know who drew it. Uh, it's uh, an artist conception. The date is unknown. Uh, and then you get some rather wild ones. Uh, Fifty years after the founding of the Diocese of Toronto, which became an archdiocese in, in 1870, we get this picture of Michael Power that looked like it was drawn freehand for the celebratory volume. So uh, a little different looking, but you can tell even by the way in which he's he's dressed with his pectoral cross and his stool that uh, someone may have had access to that earlier picture. And then you have this one, where his hair is tighter to his head. Um, he's a little bit, how should we say, more portly. Uh, and again, not terribly helpful uh, and probably rendered as uh, I figure about 1922. And then finally, we get this portrait, which was really the official portrait. It hangs in the sacristy at St. Michael's Cathedral in Toronto. And this is pretty much the, the standard uh, pictorial depiction uh, of power that we have. Although in my sleuthing and the brother knights who live in the Midwest uh, maybe of help here is that apparently the original portrait upon which this was based was taken by a priest uh, from Toronto to the Diocese of New Ulm in, in Minnesota. Um, but budgets being as they were when I was writing the biography, I didn't have a chance to uh, cross the border and go into Minnesota. So Michael Power was actually not Irish. He was uh, and not an Irish Canadian because he was born in Nova Scotia at a time when it was an independent colony. Uh, but as you can see of this map of Ireland here, his parents, uh, William Power, who was a sea captain, came from County Waterford. He was from Waterford City. Uh, and his mother, uh, Mary Roach, actually came from the eastern part of Cork and the uh, the coastal city of Yowl. Uh, and they probably arrived in Halifax somewhere about uh, 1802 or maybe even earlier. And as you can see from the map in front of you here, um, the, the maritime colonies in Canada, so just north of, of New England, uh, were in growth mode uh, from about the 1740s on. Uh, being populated by British and, interestingly enough, many Americans. So uh, uh, colonists or planters from Massachusetts, uh, from Connecticut, uh, from Rhode Island, uh, made use of the fact that the British had cleared many of the Acadian settlers, the original settlers, out of this area. And it was becoming very British, very Irish, 
places like Prince Edward Island and Cape Breton, very Scottish, but the Irish tended to congregate uh, specifically Irish Catholics in Halifax, and you see that right on the southern coast of, of Nova Scotia, and that's where uh, William Power, the sea captain, uh, operated from, uh, and significantly so because Halifax was Britain's uh, principal uh, warden of the North Atlantic. And so it was a major military uh, and shipping port and an ideal place for the powers to settle. Uh, and uh, as you can see by this graphic, which dates to the early 19th century, uh, it had a beautiful natural harbor. Uh, and you can imagine one of those ships being uh, that of uh, Captain William Power. Um, although uh, I must say that he was not a terribly successful sea captain, I came across at least three records to suggest that he ran aground or had ships uh, sink beneath him uh, uh, at least twice. Uh, and uh, so the family, uh, which was a family of eight, of which Michael was the second eldest and the oldest male, grew up in the far side uh, of, our, of our painting there uh, in the city of Halifax uh, itself. We're looking from the Dartmouth side of the harbor. Um, early 19th century Halifax was, uh, uh, as I say, a bustling a British port. Um, this is a picture of the more prominent St. Paul's Anglican Church. Um, the colony itself was fully British in the sense that uh, Catholics up until 1829 had very few rights. And so Michael Power, born in October of 1804, would have been born into uh, a minority that had very few rights. Um, Catholics uh, could not worship publicly, although many exceptions were made in the colonies. And in fact, there was a St. Peter's Chapel uh, that, uh, that did accommodate them. Catholics could not aspire to public office. Most Catholics could not vote. And so the power family essentially functioned in a city uh, where they were second-class citizens. Um, this is a picture uh, here of not a church that Michael Power would have worshipped in as a boy, he would have worshipped in the chapel that preceded it. This is St. Mary's Church, now St. Mary's Cathedral with its uh, rectory adjacent to it, uh, which was the foundation of St. Mary's University uh, in, in Halifax. But Power um, was particularly attracted to service in the church even uh, as a child. So we'll, we'll take a look at this shot. Um, one of his mentors in the early days was Father Edmund Burke, and, and you really do have to love um, his, his mitre. He became the Apostolic Vicar of Nova Scotia in 1817, but uh, Michael Power would have served uh, mass uh, for uh, Father Burke, who thought he had uh, tremendous potential. Um, uh, he trained Power privately with a number of other Catholic boys because there were no uh, publicly funded Catholic schools uh, in this British colony under the penal laws. Uh, and uh, Power himself went to public school, the, the Halifax Grammar School, uh, but uh, he took his lessons in catechism and uh, yeah, in Latin from Burke. Now, Burke was significant in his life to the extent that he suggested that Power actually uh, train for the priesthood. Uh, but, of course, in Halifax, he wouldn't have had that opportunity uh, because Halifax, of course, was under the penal laws. So what Burke decided to do was he consulted uh, with his uh, then bishop, who was uh, Joseph Octave Placy of Quebec. Now, you have to imagine uh, the scale in the early 19th century of, of the diocese in Canada and the United States. They're absolutely enormous. And so it was actually the Diocese of Quebec that covered the entire territory of, uh, of Eastern Canada, uh, except for Newfoundland, which uh, was a separate colony. Uh, but Plessis would have to go thousands of miles even to do a circuit of his diocese. He did visit uh, Halifax when Power was a youth, um, and Power was actually probably confirmed by Joseph Octave Plessis. Uh, and it was a, probably at that point where Burke introduced Power to the Bishop of Quebec, and Power was invited to be among several candidates for the priesthood, but they would have to go to Quebec, another British colony treated separately, where after the Quebec Act was passed in 1774, um, Catholics actually had rights. One of the few places in the British Empire where Catholics could vote, where Catholics could hold public office, where Catholics could aspire to be liberal professionals, but that's where Michael Power uh, would have to go. And uh, he departed uh, for Quebec 
uh, at the age of 12. Now you can imagine uh, he would have to go by sailing ship. Uh, it was a journey that would take many days uh, inland through the, the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, uh, down the, um, uh, down the uh, St. Lawrence River uh, to Quebec, but his seminary would be in Montreal. And imagine this, this is a young lad who speaks English. He may have had a little bit of Irish uh, from his mother's side, uh, but here he is uh, not speaking the French language, which is the dominant language in today's province of Quebec, but it was in colonial Quebec as well, then known as Lower Canada. And this is a, a picture of Montreal Harbor, which is even farther inland from Quebec City. And this is where he would be stationed uh, to learn uh, in the minor seminary there. Uh, this gives you a, a sense of what uh, Halifax looks like, uh, or not Halifax, sorry, Montreal looks like, again, from the opposite side of the river. Um, these are uh, small colonial outposts, um, small population, but uh, a hive of Catholic activity. So here we have a 12-year-old boy, a fish out of water from Halifax, uh, uh, living in predominantly a French city, but with a, a fairly substantial Anglo population. And he is sent there away from his family to study. And this is where he is sent. He's sent to the Ancien Collège de Montréal, uh, which uh, is uh, one of the Sulpician Fathers uh, Institutes of Education. And it's there that he becomes proficient, not only in his faith, uh, uh, but also proficient in the French language. In fact, what we do learn by looking at his uh, his records is that Michael Power actually has has a, a knack for languages. Um, he he learns French quickly. Uh, he masters Latin. Uh, he masters Greek. Uh, uh, later in life, he will master Italian. And actually, as a seminarian, he sent south of the St. Lawrence River uh, to the First Nation Abenaki on the south shore. Uh, of the St. Lawrence and the missionary priest there is astounded. He writes back to the bishop and he says, this young power has actually learned how to speak Abenaki. So this is a, a really interesting, smart, uh, innovative and courageous individual even uh, in his younger years. Uh, and uh, he seems to follow an interesting course uh, of study and then preparation for uh, his life work as a priest. So just giving, let's go back geographically for those who may not be uh, familiar. And you can see Halifax now in comparison uh, to uh, the other side, the left side of the screen, where you can see that uh, uh, Quebec City is a considerable distance, Montreal even more so. Um, where he served the Abenaki would be on the south side of the St. Lawrence River, where you see three rivers in 1634 when it was founded. Michael Power uh, is uh, of such a talent that in 1827, uh, he's actually ordained a priest, but there ha he has to have special dispensation in order to, to do that because he's actually too young. Um, uh, the province is desperate for priests, uh, and particularly in those growing areas of the map that you see there uh, in uh, places like saint Hyacinthe, in Sorel, in Sherbrooke, in Quebec, those are known as the Eastern Townships and now are now burgeoning with new immigration, particularly in the 1820s and the 1830s. Many of them are Anglophones and so there's a desperate need for a priest who not only can speak French but also can speak English to deal with many of the Irish Catholics who are moving into this area uh, prior to the famine. And for the American brothers, it'll be interesting to note that he's actually uh, ordained by Bishop Dubois, uh, the predecessor of Bishop Hughes uh, of New York City. And I think that's one of the interesting things about the church in this period is there's great fluidity uh, across the Canadian-American border. And so uh, American Catholic leaders know the, the Catholic leaders in British North America and vice versa. And they're constantly working with one another in terms of education, uh, in terms of projects, and even looking out for remote parts of their diocese. It's not, and it, there's an interesting parallel here because it's, uh, it's, it's no surprise that Father Michael McGivney in his early days of preparation actually goes to the Eastern Townships in Quebec uh, to begin his priestly formation. This is not unusual in the early and mid 19th century. So let's pick up the story. Uh, an ordained man now, 
Uh, and his first uh, challenge really comes in the Eastern Township. Uh, we'll take a look here. It's in the St. Francois River Valley, and this is a rather romantic look at a very rugged wilderness that would have met uh, Michael Power in the in the late 1820s. This is actually a mill uh, in the current city of, uh, of Sherbrooke, Quebec. And it's there where he really cut his priestly teeth. Now, interestingly enough, among his, his, uh, his his uh, chattels that he leaves behind are a number of texts in canon law that he correct, uh, collects as he's doing his kind of saddlebag ministry up and down the St. Francois River Valley. Um, his headquarters is uh, in Drummondville, and this is a sketch of his early church there. And he would have been dealing primarily with French Canadian Catholics who were well settled in the area and Irish Catholics and phony Irish priests who were coming in and charging for sacraments and, in a sense, ripping off the local population who uh, didn't know that they weren't officially priests. Nowadays, you have a celebrate card that you have to show when you enter a diocese. In those days on the frontier, uh, anything went. And so he spent a lot of time uh, tracking down uh, men who were baptizing, marrying people uh, uh, non-canonically. And I think uh, in this sense, he 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 grew uh, to uh, be interested in canon law. How do you bring you know the laws of the church and the structure and the discipline to this undisciplined frontier? And Michael Power, like you know many other priests who served the frontier in both Canada and the United States, would have experienced very similar uh, situations. And so he's always concerned about the phony priests, about um, uh, lazy Catholics living in this area. Um, so he cuts his teeth in the river valley uh, and then he is sent uh, as you see at the extreme right of your screen you see Cornwall and just above that you see the Ottawa River which essentially uh, for the most part divides the current province uh, of Quebec on the on the north side and Ontario in those days upper and lower Canada um, he's actually assigned to the Quebec side or the lower Canadian side of the Ottawa River at a place called Montebello um, Montebello would become one of the cause celebs uh, in the uh, rebellions in Canada in 1837-1838. And for the American brothers, yes, we had rebellions here. And actually, those rebellions in 1837-38 uh, were um, were inspired in part by uh, uh, American liberty uh, and uh, uh, American movements uh, dating from uh, the American Revolution. In this case, this seigneury happened to be owned by Louis Joseph Papineau, who was actually one of the leaders of the Francophone rebellion uh, against the British Crown in 1837. And where does Michael Power end up in the prelude to that rebellion? right here on this estate. And you can see the, the chateau hidden uh, among the trees. Um, that's still there today, but beside it is the world's largest log cabin, which is the Chateau Montebello, one of the finest hotels. Uh, and I suppose the uh, Quebec Tourist Bureau should reward me for giving them that plug, but that's another matter. Um, so Michael Power is here constantly uh, doing battle with Papineau's brother to make sure that the church is well established in what is considered a frontier area of Canada at the time. And uh, what he manages to do is he sets up an infrastructure at Montebello uh, and there's really interesting testimony to how cold it got. I'm from the Ottawa Valley myself and uh, it does blow cold up the valley in the winter with sub-zero temperatures. Um, there is one story told of, of Michael Power being in one of the mission churches uh, across from Hawkesbury uh, and the sacramental wine actually uh, congealing and trying to freeze in the chalice as he, uh, as he tries to celebrate mass for the small local French Catholic population uh, it, that he's uh, entrusted to. Um, he had to cross the river, it was dangerous, and eventually uh, when he protested that he had no help, uh, he was moved uh, by uh, the Bishop of Montreal, once again south of the St. Lawrence, this is uh, Chateauguay, his parish was St. Martin, which was a small village south of there, and lo and behold, it became the epicenter of the 1838 rebellion, and Michael Power was actually placed under house arrest uh, by his parishioners as they went off to fight uh, the British Army. Um, they lost, uh, and uh, interestingly enough, as a very charitable individual, he went through the lists of those 
parishioners who had been captured and singled out those who had had nothing to do with the rebellion and actually saved them from the scaffold uh, in Montreal in 1838 and saved several of them from being exiled in the penal colonies of New South Wales in Australia where several of them uh, were sent. So uh, Michael Power showed compassion uh, at a time when he could have been fairly vindictive. Um, his own politics are a bit of a mystery because he read both the conservative papers that came out of Anglophone Montreal and he read uh, Edmund Bailey O'Callaghan's Irish Nationalist paper, which also uh, came uh, out of Montreal. And uh, Callaghan had been one of the uh, Anglophone leaders uh, of the rebellion uh, and was very well known to power. So speeding up a little bit, there's our, our shot of uh, uh, some of his parishioners being taken off uh, by uh, British troops, uh, either to the prisons, the scaffold, or to uh, Australia. His uh, final parish was here, uh, and that parish is at La Prairie, uh, across the river uh, from Montreal. And it was in that parish uh, in the late 1830s that he became known uh, to this man. Um, this is uh, Ignace Bourget. Uh, he was the Bishop of Montreal, and as you can see, he served in Montreal for 36 years. He was probably at his, at the time, one of the up and coming to become one of the most powerful bishops in the Canadian church and perhaps in its history. He was extremely influential. He was an ultramontane, he was Roman, and he spotted talent in Michael Power. And in fact, he knew uh, that more bishops would be needed, and Michael Power became his vicar general, uh, traveled with him to Europe uh, in 1840-41 as his secretary, and that's where this, the story of Michael Power really uh, begins uh, to take off. Um, it's in those sessions in Rome, and here's a beautiful shot of the Vatican uh, taken from a, a 19th century print, very much uh, looking like the way it would look when Michael Power went there for the first time in early 1841. Uh, and Bourget, in a sense, was shopping him uh, to the Pope at the time, Gregory XVI, making a claim that the western part of Canada needed a bishop. And uh, uh, Michael Power didn't know at the time, uh, because in the private audiences, Bourget was convincing Gregory XVI that this young Power was the man uh, for that job multilingual, respected by the British, respected by his parishioners, solid in his theology and his canon law, and uh, Bourget made the pitch. In fact, one of the, the, the few letters that we have from Michael Power at this time expresses his, um, his horror at being nominated as the Bishop of Western Upper Canada. Um, he was a very humble man and had preferred that someone else have uh, that responsibility. He was quite happy uh, to be uh, uh, the, uh, the pastor of La Prairie. But something interesting happens at that. Knowing that he's going to leave that parish to go into the wilderness, um, he offers it to the Jesuits who have been re-invited to come back to Canada. And in 1841, that begins a bond between the Society of Jesus and Michael Power that will come back uh, later uh, as he begins to, to build his diocese. So this is, gives you a sense of how vast Michael Power's diocese was. It was originally called Western Upper Canada, but he chose the city of Toronto in December of 1841, essentially to be his uh, Episcopal seat. But you can see that this, this map doesn't even do justice uh, to, to the areas that are covered by his diocese. Um, Kingston was originally covered the entire what if now it would be the province of Ontario. But if you look carefully, um, this diocese stretches beyond Lake Huron. It stretches all the way to Lake Superior. It covers parts of Lake Ontario, all of the north shore of Lake Erie and the eastern shore of Lake Huron, all of Georgian Bay. It's a vast territory. Um, 
one of the only accessible ways to get there is over the Lachine Rapids. And this is a, a graphic from the time of a steamer going over the Lachine Rapids out of Montreal, trying to get into Upper Canada, now Ontario. Um, this road is uh, is now the Kingston Road or Dundas Street. So some of the Canadian Knights will know this as made one of the major thoroughfares that 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 uh, connects uh, Kingston uh, and Toronto, uh, Hamilton, and the the town of Dundas. But this is uh, the the road as it looked at the time when uh, Michael Power would have been making his way to Toronto by boat, thank God, not by this rutted road. Uh, it would have been terribly damaging to his body in a carriage. So back to the original map. But just to give you an extent, um, this is uh, uh, the southwestern extreme. Uh, American Knights will recognize, maybe not, in the shadow of the horizon is the city of Detroit. Uh, and uh, this chapel, Assumption Chapel, uh, would eventually become a Jesuit and then a Basilian church, but this was the southwestern extremity of the diocese, so uh, going right to the uh, Detroit River. Uh, this was the extreme west. This is a chapel eventually built by the Jesuits, the Chapel of the Immaculate Conception, and was now the city of Thunder Bay, which is at the lakehead uh, of Lake Superior. Uh, and uh, finally, we have uh, what looks like the city of Hamilton, which is not that far from Toronto, uh, and of course is the, uh, uh, the steel city of Canada today, but an important town in Powers Diocese. Because of the extent of the diocese, Power spent early 1842 canoeing and boating as much of it as he could. He went as far as Sault Ste. Marie. He went back to Manitoulin Island. Uh, he tried to explore as much as he could. And those areas that he could not see frequently, he made arrangements with the um, apostolic vicar of northern Michigan, Frederick Barraga, Bishop Barraga, the famous uh, missionary bishop there, and with John Hughes in New York uh, to basically share jurisdiction over the Niagara area and uh, over western New York State because power was closer. And again, I think that gives you a sense that 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 ecclesially there's a greater degree of fluidity uh, between uh, what is now Canada and the United States uh, than there is in later periods. Um, this is his entry into Toronto Harbor. Uh, Toronto Harbor in those days looking very different. It wasn't a Toronto Island, it was a Toronto Peninsula. It was a storm in the 1850s that destroyed uh, the, the joining with the mainland, but it was a beautiful natural harbor and that's where he established his capital. Very, very small uh, town by that stretch, by the 1840s had about 20,000 people. And that gives you a look before the great Toronto fires in the late 1840s as to what Toronto looked like. A bustling port city, you can see a number of spires. Um, it, one of its nicknames, other than the Belfast of Canada, is uh, the city of churches. And uh, largely a Protestant city, Catholics never made up more than 15% of the population in those days, except a little bit after the famine, they, they rose to about one in five people. Uh, but you have strong presentation there by the Anglican Church, or as uh, Americans would know it, the Episcopalian Church, Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, uh, and uh, of course, Roman Catholics, who, who were mostly Irish, some French Canadians, some Scots, and some First Nations people who came to the city. And, that was his first church, that's St. Paul's Church. It was his cathedral. Um, that structure no longer exists. It was replaced uh, in the uh, early 20th century uh, by a much larger building. Well, so Michael Power arrives in Toronto and uh, he arrives at a time of pre-famine Irish migration. But of course, we know that in 1845, about 30% of the potato crop of Ireland failed. Um, it was the staple food and uh, uh, the, the food that kept them alive in Ireland, particularly if you were working tenant farmer on, on small con acre plots or, or two to three acre plots, uh, working for middlemen, larger farmers and ultimately uh, landlords, about one third of whom were Anglo-Irish or British, who essentially uh, did not live uh, on their estates. This is a beautiful scene 
uh, of Ladies View in, in County Kerry, uh, a county that was devastated uh, by uh, the, the failure of the potato. And just to consider um, how important the potato was at the time, it was, it was estimated that uh, uh, average Irish man, peasant, ate about 14 pounds of potatoes per day. Um, it was a huge yield for a very powerful crop, very nutritious crop on these lands. And when the blight, which essentially ironically came from North America, uh, spread by rain, spread by ships carrying cargo to Ireland and Northern Europe, when those arrived uh, in Ireland, uh, um, it had a devastating effect at least in 1845, and there was hope that in 1846 the crop would rebound, and lo and behold, about 90% of the crop failed. Um, this was a major catastrophe that was mishandled by the British government, that was consumed uh, by uh, a capitalistic theory of laissez-faire, that the least amount a government can interfere in an economy, uh, the better it is that market forces can correct themselves. Well, by the end of the famine, that theory saw 1.1 million people die in Ireland and about 1.5 million to 2 million migrate. The Irish population has never recovered uh, from the famine. Uh, because at the beginning of the famine, it was about 8 million, and it was between 5 and 6 million uh, at the end of the famine period in 1851. Um, and they fled. Uh, if they didn't flee, they would starve. And the poorest In 1846-47, the crops did network connection has been re-established, which is good. So we'll go back, 109,000 Irish left British ports for British North America, about 119,000 left for American ports, which were more expensive because the American ports were more stringent uh, than uh, Canadian ports. This is a shot of Telegraph Hill on Grosil, which is an island about 40 kilometers northeast of Quebec City in the St. Lawrence River. And this was the quarantine station. Uh, where Irish migrants, particularly to the inner colonies, to, to Canada, uh, as it was known in there, Canada East, Canada West, what we now know as Ontario and Quebec, this is where they had to land and be checked for typhus. Um, this was the, uh, this is constructed much later, but it gives you a sense of, of looking east along the uh, St. Lawrence River. This would have been the first part of Canada uh, that Irish migrants fleeing the famine uh, would have seen. Um, it is uh, a bleak landscape, um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, if you were found to bear the symptoms of typhus, uh, you were, you were disembarked from your vessel here. And I mean, in this time of COVID-19, where we have a highly communicable virus for which we have no cure or vaccine at this point, let's go back to 1847 or Black 47, typhus was what we would now consider a fairly uh, easily remedied bacterial infection with antibiotics. Those antibiotics were not known then. And people who died of typhus tragically infected themselves. Normally, it was carried by a louse in the 
species of a louse. There were lice on board ships, uh, which is why they called it ship's fever. Um, uh, the, lice, uh, the, the lice would land on your body, they would, they would bite you and then defecate near the wound. Of course, you're itchy, you would scratch it, and essentially you allowed then the rickettsia bacteria to enter your body. So uh, what would happen is, is that you didn't know you were infected for about four or five days uh, uh, because you didn't show any symptoms, sometimes over a course of a week. So some people who looked healthy at this station actually were moved on. And in fact, uh, the, the, the typhus then you know, exposed itself to the, to, to the rest of the world uh, in inland ports like Quebec or, or Montreal. Um, this is an artist's conception of the Irish landing at Gros Isle. Um, they were quarantined on the island, uh, and uh, it's not surprising that uh, in these lazarettos, thousands of Irish died, mostly of typhus or dysentery, uh, some of cholera, and we even have cases of smallpox uh, that erupt on the island. Uh, and you can then imagine the reaction of the host community, and that is as a, of uh, abject horror. Um, this is the inside of one of the original lazarettos from 1847 and just in your mind's eye imagine this stacked with bunks with sometimes two and three people infected in each bunk uh, and lice hopping from one to another uh, a very hardy bacteria as well it can live on floors on blankets on the ground uh, and you can contract it that way without even being bitten by the louse uh, over 5,000 people lie in this cemetery at Gros Isle. Um, this was the promise of Canada uh, to uh, so many of those Irish migrants who left uh, in desperation uh, during the famine. Uh, and this cross was erected in 1909 by the Ancient Order of Hibernians to commemorate uh, the Irish dead there. Um, these aren't bushes around the cross. Uh, this cross is enormous. Uh, those are the tops uh, of, uh, of spruce trees. So gives you a sense of the scale. Now, where's Michael Power at this time? Michael Power is actually in Ireland. Um, he, is, he is there uh, trying to get uh, a number of religious orders to come to his frontier diocese to uh, essentially found schools and, and other public institutions. Um, and Michael Power uh, sees the famine firsthand in Ireland. He sails on a steamship as opposed to uh, a sailing ship back to New York via Halifax to visit his mother, and then he's on to Toronto. He's there just in advance of the first wave of, uh, of famine migrants who hit the city in June. Um, this is where they stop first. As you can see, this is a rock dredged from the St. Lawrence River uh, and is placed at the site at Pont Saint-Charles where so many Irish died in the fever sheds of Montreal. Why? Because typhus showed up there and it says on the rock of to commemorate the 6,000 immigrants there. So interestingly enough, over the entire sailing season, about one in every five Irish migrant uh, died before the end of the year, mostly because of communicable disease. Michael Power, of course, is in Ireland. The one sister, uh, the the one order of religious that he does recruit are the Loretto sisters, spelled with one T in Ireland, two T's in Canada. This is Sister Teresa Dees, who was the youngest uh, of the four postulant or the four sisters that came uh, to Toronto. They arrive in the middle of the famine catastrophe in Toronto. And so we, we see Michael Power there. He comes back to Toronto and advocates uh, for Irish migrants and says, don't blame them for this particular situation. Uh, and he attends public meetings. He speaks publicly uh, with regard to uh, the Irish predicament. And Predicament it is because Toronto with its population of about 20,000 in 1847 uh, has over 38,000 migrants land in the city. It's absolutely staggering that twice the population practically uh, uh, comes in to a city that is woefully prepared. Yes, they had a board of health. Yes, they had a hospital designated on the outskirts of the city uh, for Irish famine migrants. Yes, they built 16 uh, sheds outside that hospital, but still uh, it was a catastrophe for a very young city handling probably the worst uh, epidemic in its history until now. Um, there are 38,560 migrants who land in the city and 1,124 uh, died 
Only about 2,000 remained in Toronto and the rest were moved on by a man by the name of Edward McElderry, who was in charge of the port. The healthy ones were moved on to points west in Ontario to the Niagara Peninsula and many on to places like New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan. Uh, McElderry was uh, heroic in his own right. He died in November uh, of, uh, of related illnesses, uh, leaving a very large family, but he had been recommended to the post and was unique in the fact that he was one of the few Irish Catholics who was actually serving uh, for uh, what was a largely Protestant town at the time. Um, this just is from the film, Death or Canada, uh, depicting uh, one of the migrants coming to the fever sheds. I'm particularly proud because that's my eldest daughter, Erin, who, uh, uh, who was one of the extras in the film. But it, uh, it does give you a sense of, 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 of the suffering and the beauty. This was the fever hospital that Michael Power visited daily. And I think it should be underscored here that Michael Power had a group of priests with him in the city. Uh, most of those priests uh, contracted typhus and were ill in the Episcopal Palace. Michael Power, twice a day, made the journey to the fever sheds alone uh, to serve uh, the, the Irish who were stricken. Um, this is a CGI'd version of the hospital and the sheds that comes from the film. Uh, Death or Canada to give you a sense of 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 what Michael Power was dealing with uh, daily as he went uh, to visit the fever sheds. This is uh, the the film's depiction of Michael Power uh, as he's giving solace, saying prayers with those who are lying uh, in the fever sheds as they're recreated in the film. Uh, the doctor in the background was uh, George Grisset. He was an Anglican. Uh, and it's interesting, here is an Anglican doctor who is in charge of the hospital, a Catholic bishop who might normally not be, how should we say, friendly with one another, but Michael Power had been known as, before his time, as a powerful uh, uh, ecumenist. Uh, and they worked well together, and it's a, a, st a statement for the entire city. Uh, nurse Bailey in the background was a Protestant woman who, who was a head nurse. All three of these people die uh, as a result of typhus uh, during uh, the outbreak in Toronto in 1847. Um, this is the memorial that's left in Toronto, uh, built by Robert Kearns and the Ireland Pound, uh, Park Foundation. Uh, it imitates quite well Rowan Gillespie statues at Dublin Quay. Um, this is the, the depiction of these same people leaving Dublin in the other statue called the departure. This one's called the arrival. Uh, and uh, you have fewer people because of the death of to, to, to typhus and other diseases, but this welcome to the possibility of starting a new life. And in the background, uh, Kilkenny limestone wall, uh, the interior of which are inscribed with at least 600 of those 1,124 names, including the name of Michael Power, because Michael Power uh, uh, died. Uh, he made a public uh, a meeting statement in September of 1847. Uh, he then retreated to uh, meet the Loretto sisters who found him very nervous because he was afraid that they would contract typhus. He had them established in a local home uh, and by late September he began to show signs of typhus. On October 1st at about six in the morning uh, Michael Power died and they say that his funeral the subsequent week was one of the largest in the city's history. He had respect from the Methodist community, the leaders of the Anglican community, the Presbyterian community, and uh, uh, for a man who, uh, for the most part, uh, gave his life uh, for those who were in his spiritual and, as the case may be, in the sheds, in his physical care. So it's no reason, uh, it's not surprising, that once we read the story of Michael Power, uh, we come to understand why Cardinal Collins thought this truly is a martyr of charity. And I'll end my remarks there and leave some time for questions. Mark, thank you so much. Uh, a very interesting presentation. I wanna just follow up very quickly on what you ended with. Can you tell us when the cause for Bishop Power was formally introduced? Yeah, it was um, a good question. Um, it uh, it was introduced, I mean, uh, the announcement was made in 2017, and I know that the the Cardinals had to sort of keep keep a distance from it and and have uh, uh, some workers at the Chancery, um, you know, begin to gather materials. And I've helped them because 
over the years I collected for <laughs> for 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 someone who left only one small box of papers and some letter books behind um, American diocese were very gracious in you know uh, transcribing or sending me photocopies of his correspondence with various bishops uh, and so we've been gathering all of these fragments from Europe and from uh, uh, from Quebec and from uh, other parts of Canada and the United States. So um, the case is the case has has been built. I don't know what it, at stage uh, it's at now, uh, but um, uh, it was. And the irony too is is that uh, he was for for most Torontonians up until about ten years ago, his his story was 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 not well known. There is a high school named after him in Toronto, Michael Power. Uh, Catholic secondary school, and there's a street named after him in front of St. Paul's Church. But for the most part, he was one of those, those hidden heroes uh, that's now come to light. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me take a step back and apologize to you and to our uh, participants for the hiccup we had uh, there in the middle. Um, I uh, hopefully was able to resolve it quickly and uh, am grateful for your patience. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to address your questions to Dr. McGowan. Use the uh, use the questions utility. Look for the uh, icon to the right of your screen, and if you have particular questions that you'd like to uh, pose to him, I welcome them. I've made note of a couple, uh, but uh, your your opportunity continues. Um, Mark, I'm struck by uh, a couple of things, and uh, these were brought up in the questions especially with regard to Father Michael McGivney. Now, we have an audience uh, that is made up of uh, either Knights of Columbus or certainly people who are very familiar with the uh, organization. Father McGivney uh, attended school both in St. Hyacinth and also in Montreal, and he was schooled not in Canada, but uh, later in the United States in Baltimore by the uh, Sulpicians. So uh, although... Uh, Bishop Power would have died five years before McGivney's birth. Um, you know there was some similarities in their their own, uh, shall we say, seminary or priestly formation. Ab absolutely. I mean, the Sulpicians had a he had a huge influence on on Power's thinking, and uh, uh, it was always thought that uh, um, he owed a great deal to the foundations that he received by the Sulpicians in Montreal. Uh, who also ran the Grand Seminaire uh, there later, but although his he went to uh, Quebec City uh, for his uh, seminary formation. But uh, um, when you read some of the contemporary sources, they always see his even his interest in canon law as being something that uh, resulted from his education by the Sulpicians. But you have to understand the Sulpicians were a powerful uh, group of of, of lay religious priests, uh, not officially an order, uh, they actually were the seigneurs of the island of Montreal and were powerful enough that they could do battle with the Bishop of Montreal over over what they considered to be their historic territory. And in fact, Bourget and the Sulpicians went back and forth uh, numerous times over, uh, over parish boundaries uh, and the like. And that was after uh, Power's time, but they, they're, they're truly an important influence on his development. It's interesting because, you know, when you think about Father McGivney's own uh, spirituality and his ambition for the Knights of Columbus, especially the, the charitable outreach component of the organization, you see similarities in what uh, Bishop Power had and the, the fact that they both were, as you say, formed by the Sulpicians. Uh, McGivney, too, had some exposure to Vincentian spirituality when he studied at Niagara University. And um, both of those religious communities were established in uh, in the 1700s, I think, or at least influenced by uh, the spirituality of that time in uh, the country of France. Yeah, and I guess for the second order for power would be um, the Jesuits because uh, he gave them his home parish and then eventually recruited them, and they took over uh, mission stations, uh, you know, in Lake Superior and uh, across uh, the river uh, from Detroit. So I would say, in, in some ways, the Society of Jesus was very influential uh, in his uh, in his thinking as well. In fact, his letters to the Jesuits, which I uncovered in the uh, the Jesuit archives in Rome, were quite were quite interesting because he said, you know, the Jesuits under Jean de Brebeuf and Gabriel Lallemand began a mission. It was cut short in the 17th century. Now is your opportunity to continue it uh, in, in our own time. And uh, uh, he was uh, 
he was considered a great friend of the Jesuits. By the way, the Vincentians do have a Bishop of Toronto. It's uh, not Michael Powers' immediate successor, but uh, uh, Bishop John Joseph Lynch uh, was uh, was trained in Paris and uh, uh, an Irishman from Fermanagh. Uh, the shout out goes to, to the north of Ireland, my friend Seamus. And uh, he, uh, uh, so we have a Vincentian connection in uh, Toronto as well. Another question that we got, Mark, you cited that the bishop uh, was actually on a trip to Ireland, of all places, at the occasion of uh, the uh, influx or the beginning of the influx of this migration wave. Um, had you been aware that he had uh, traveled to Ireland before? His roots were there, but uh, was that his, his first trip back to his parents' home country? It's actually the first that we know of. Um, I'm not entirely sure. We don't have much details of his what I call the Great European Tour of 1841. I know he 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 is in London for some time, uh, but there's there's no record of him going to Ireland in 1841. But I mean, we do have the record of him going to Rathfarnham, where the Loretto sisters uh, uh, are headquartered outside of Dublin, which is now you know incorporated into Dublin, and we know that he traveled throughout the countryside. Um, and saw the famine firsthand. Whether he had been there or not prior to that, we just don't know. One of the places that he did go as frequently as he could was Halifax to see his widowed mother. His, his father died while he was studying in Montreal. And in fact, um, all of his male siblings, three brothers died. There's only one known living descendant from Michael Power. Um, one of his sisters married a fellow called Mooney who moved to Boston. So if there are any brothers in Boston who know any descendants of Michael Power Mooney, who was born in 1848, that would be helpful to know because he is the only living descendant of that particular family. So. And then uh, one last question, Mark. You mentioned that Bishop Power was placed under house arrest by his parishioners. Can, can you elaborate? I mean, that's a that's a very humorous story. Yeah, well, we 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 don't know all that much about the context, but um, evidently, um, because he was he was he was not francophone, and because he, um, uh, you know, he was respectful of of public authority, which was British at the time, and because the clergy had been absolutely forbidden to take part in the rebellions um, by Bishop Lartigue of Montreal, I mean, on, on pain of excommunication, um, although there was uh, a couple of priests who did, they were French Canadian, but in this particular case, um, uh, power probably was seen as loyal to the crown, uh, and uh, the the parishioners who were part of this second wave of the rebellion uh, kept him uh, locked up in his in his rectory, and uh, as they went off to uh, uh, to to fight the British army, and uh, what happens at the end is I mean uh, rather interesting because he he doesn't he, he doesn't get vindictive about it. What he does is he he demands to see the lists of the prisoners, as I said, uh, and check to see whether or not uh, undeserving or the those who who had nothing to do or had been sort of taken up in the mob by force or were good parishioners were actually spared uh, what came out of it um it is it is uh, uh, a rather amusing episode but probably terrifying because all of these people were armed so well, Mark, thank you so much for your presentation today and for sharing with us uh, the story of Bishop Powers. Uh, I want to share with our participants that this session has been recorded and will be available later today on the Facebook and YouTube channels for the Knights of Columbus Museum. And I will send a reminder email to all of you yesterday, with, uh, tomorrow with those links. Next week, we will have a presentation from Dr. Jason King who is a Montreal native, but who now resides in Ireland and works for uh, the National Famine Museum in Ireland. He'll be talking about the Grey Nuns, the uh, Sisters of Charity who were on Grosseal and uh, served uh, the famine Irish as they were arriving. Uh, so that'll be an interesting follow-up to today's presentation. Thank you very much for your participation today. And uh, until next week, I wish you good health and goodbye.